For as long as dinosaur bones have been discovered, there was paleo art. This is how artists tried to reconstruct what long extinct animals or plants would look like in life. Coined in 1980 by Mark Hallett, the field has become rather popular, with hundreds of amazing artists producing thousands of marvellous art pieces. But this art form goes back long before Hallett was even born, with the first pieces being made in the 1800s. Since then, our understanding of these animals has changed massively from what we knew back then, resulting in some pretty outdated and strange depictions. Take, for example, the oldest piece of paleo art produced. In 1800, the proclaimed father of paleontology, George Cuvier, received a letter from a friend called Johann Hermann. Within it, he informs Cuvier of a fossil that he hasn't seen with his own eyes, but had caught his interest after seeing an illustration of it published in a book. Said fossil was the type species of the famous Pterodactylus. Herman had attached two drawings of what he thought the fossil animal may have looked like in life along with the letter. He stated in the letter how he thought the fossil represented a transition between birds and mammals. Yeah, it was the 1800s and our understanding of family trees is different now. So, he reconstructed the animal as having fur, a long bushy tail and external ears. Comparing the two side by side, there is a lot that he could have done better with the reconstruction. The lack of crest and the fact that Pterodactylus was actually a reptile being the main two. But shockingly, some stuff he did get right. For one, he and Cuvier correctly identified that this animal would have been capable of flying. This was based on the animal's long fourth finger, which Herman thought supported a skin membrane. While technically correct, the actual shape of this structure is off in the reconstruction, as it's shown to be this weird semicircular shape that extends from the arm down to the animal's legs. This contrasts how this structure would have actually looked, which is much more wing-shaped. Another thing that Herman got right about this animal was the presence of fur. Well, not technically fur. Pterosaurs, like Pterodactylus, possessed small hair-like structures called pycnofibers that help these animals keep warm. So, extra points to Herman for including this. But this reconstruction isn't as hairy as our next animal, the woolly mammoth. This animal is one of the most recognisable prehistoric creatures, and thanks to several well-preserved specimens, we actually have a pretty good understanding of what this animal would have looked like. In fact, one of these specimens was the basis for the next piece of paleo art. In 1803, Roman Boltanov was sold a pair of mammoth tusks by a local tribesman in Russia. This is a very typical story, as you can imagine. But Boltanov's interest peaked further when the man he bought the tusks from mentioned they had come from an actual mammoth. So, naturally, he asked to see this. Once he was taken to the carcass by the man, he took some measurements and produced a drawing of how this animal must have looked like in life, resulting in this. Okay, it's not perfect, but that's the point of this video. For one, the animal's trunk is missing, but in fairness to Boltanov, this isn't his fault. When they arrived at the carcass, it had been defaced by scavengers and had begun to rot. This meant that when he arrived, the trunk had already fallen off. Also, due to the tusks being removed from the animal, Boltanov had to guess how they would have looked when placed back on the body. Unfortunately, he put them the wrong way round. Instead of the tusks pointing inwards to one another, he positioned them pointing outwards and backwards. However, despite this rather bizarre reconstruction, the drawing was enough to pique the interest of one Mikhail Adams, a Russian botanist who came across the drawings in a local newspaper. After seeing it, he set out on an expedition to recover the specimen, which he did successfully. He displayed it in St. Petersburg, with the specimen christened as the Adams Mammoth. I've made a video about this specimen on the channel, so check it out if you're interested. Moving from extinct mammals to dinosaurs now, we have this reconstruction of a diplodocus that has seemingly broken its legs. Made in 1916 by German paleoartist Heinrich Harder, the drawing shows this sauropod sporting a rather unusual sprawling gait. 
reminiscent of modern reptiles like alligators. This is entirely different from how these animals are thought to have held themselves, with their legs underneath them. So what happened to this poor individual? This is an example of how our understanding of prehistoric life has changed from all those years ago. When the drawing was produced, it was believed that these animals were, at the very least, semi-aquatic in nature. This is because paleontologists thought that with these animals being as big as they were, they couldn't possibly hold their weight on land, and had to use the buoyancy of the water to keep them upright. So, one Oliver Perry Hay suggested that for the animal not to sink into the swamp it definitely occupied, it would have had more sprawled out legs to prevent this. However, there are two significant issues with this. The first is that for the animal to achieve this position in life, it would have had to essentially break its legs, with nearly all the bones in this area being dislocated, which would have been painful to this animal in life. The second problem is that the animal's ribcage extended much further than was shown in the reconstruction, meaning that if this was how the animal walked, it would have scraped its belly along the ground. All this imagined pain that the animal must have been in led people at the time to quote, If this reconstruction was correct, then it was no wonder that this animal went extinct. However, that would not be the case for our next animal. If the ability portrayed in it was correct, I don't think even the asteroid would have wanted to mess with it. Apparently, according to this piece of paleo art, Parasaurolophus could breathe fire. Now, this paleo art isn't inaccurate because of a different understanding or a lack of evidence at the time. Instead, it's the idea of one man, Dwayne Gish, a creationist scientist who published this very drawing in a book entitled Dinosaurs by Design where he states how dinosaurs fit into the stories from the Bible and that these animals coexisted alongside humans. Yeah, I'm not even gonna delve into that can of worms. What I will delve into though is the justification given in the book behind this ability. See, Gish's idea was that this animal stored chemicals in its crest that would mix together and combust once it was spit out into the air. While ridiculous, he does compare this ability to that of a modern animal, the Bombardier beetle. This insect has sacs within its abdomen that contain chemicals that can cause irritation, which it can spray to deter attackers. While this is a fine example, it doesn't hold up in Parasaurolophus. While yes, this animal does have hollow chambers within the skull, they definitely didn't hold chemicals for fire breathing. The actual reason for this hollow crest is thought to be a communication aid, with it acting as a resonating chamber for the animal's calls, so it has nothing to do with fire breathing. In fact, a book published by Philip J. Center pointed out how this mechanism of defense could cause more damage to the animal than the predator it was defending itself from. So, once again, no, this isn't what this animal used its crest for. But I credit Gish for trying to develop a unique use for the animal's anatomy. That is one of the appeals of paleo art, trying to come up with unique behaviours and uses that these animals would have used their bodies for. But what happens when the body of the animal you are basing the art on is entirely wrong? Well, that is what happened with our next piece of art. Produced by the infamous paleontologist Edward Drinker Cope, the picture details several extinct reptiles uncovered in the New Jersey area. The genera Hadrosaurus, Dryptosaurus, and Mosasaurus are included, all of which have their problems. However, the one animal I want to focus on is this guy right here. What animal is this meant to be? Well, this guy is meant to represent an Elasmosaurus. But as you can tell, something isn't quite right with it. That being that the animal's neck is a lot shorter. That is because Cope, the man who first discovered this genus, incorrectly thought the animal's tail was its neck. So he put its head on it. This error wasn't pointed out to Cope until after the painting was made and his findings were published in scientific articles. The error was pointed out by a good friend of Cope at the time, Othniel Charles Marsh. However, after Marsh pointed out this error, Cope became furious as he thought Marsh was mocking his mistake. 
sparking a period known as the Bone Wars, which is a topic that could make its own video. So if you guys want to hear about that, let me know in the comments below. Until next time, bye bye